Hi, everyone. I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone wherever you're joining us from across this beautiful country. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Andrew Holland, National Media Relations Director with Nature Conservancy of Canada, coming to you from Fredericton, New Brunswick, the traditional lands of the Wallistiqui people. For those not familiar with Nature Conservancy of Canada, we are a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and its partners has helped protect 15 million hectares, coast to coast to coast. Put that big total into context, 15 million hectares, that's almost five times the size of Vancouver Island or twice the size of New Brunswick. These conservation lands provide a home for 244 species at risk across the country, which is important for their survival. The spring season is a great time to be thinking about helping birds and pollinator species. They've been struggling due to the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. And the reason why that we're all here today is that each of us care and want to make a difference in and around our homes and communities. So this is a, a valuable conservation conversation to be having. Which brings us to tonight's event. With us is Dr. Vari McFarlane, our Director of Science and Stewardship. Vari is based in London, Ontario. Vari will be sharing fascinating facts about the birds, bugs, and blooms around us, and practical tips on how we can all make a difference for these species, whether they're in our backyards, on our balcony, or on our windowsill. And Vari will answer the questions that would be coming in or were sent in prior to starting. We invited people to submit questions in advance and we've received over 200, which demonstrates a lot of interest in our topic. If you have a question that you haven't submitted yet, you still can. If you're watching from Zoom, you'll notice a Q&A icon in your menu on your screen. And for folks watching on Facebook Live, you can submit a question in the comments section. I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Vari McFarland. Good evening. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks. Um, I'm so happy to be discussing birds, bees, you know, real birds, real bees, and other pollinators that you can start to see, hopefully, if we get some spring at some point in the future, which I'm promised is, is coming soon. Um, as Andrew mentioned, the twin crises have really affected both bird and pollinator or insect populations in general. Um, so we have a little bit of dib and gloom to kind of get through quickly, but I promise we'll get to some really neat solutions that we can all all try out at home or at the cottage or on our balcony um, to kind of help out. So one of the things that really breaks my heart in particular as a, as a bird watcher is that every single year right here in Canada, somewhere in the region of 200 million birds are killed every single year. Um, and sometimes their nests are destroyed through various things that we end up doing during the course of our lives inadvertently. Um, and unfortunately, these numbers are, are real. They're, they're, they're from you know, biologists that have really carefully studied impacts of, of various things on, on our feathery friends. One thing in particular that, that really stands out here is um, about 200 million of that number are actually killed by free roaming cats. Um, and that's, that's a really heartbreaking number. And again, unfortunately, a, a very real number. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things we can all do about these things. And uh, we're also gonna talk about plants and that link might not seem very obvious at first to some of you, um, but we'll, we'll kind of pr promise to explain what these links are. Um, and Andrea, it looks like we've got quite a lot of questions already pouring in and, and in the, the few days leading, leading up to tonight. So do you want to jump in with some questions to get us going? A sure thing. Um, and, and again, we'll do our best to get as, to as many of the questions as possible during the time we have. And, and be assured that if, if we don't answer your question in this session, we will respond to you within the next couple of weeks via email. The most common question so far is, how can I attract birds and pollinators to my backyard, balcony, or windowsill? Uh, should we be using bird feeders and bee hotels? How can we keep squirrels and other wildlife from eating our plants and seed from our bird feeders? And what native plants and ground cover should I be looking for for my yard? And should I be raking and mowing in the spring? So Vary, let's start with this one. 
uh, plants and birds are, are closely linked, aren't they? Gee, so that's a lot of questions and some fun, diverse topics to, to get through this evening. So I'm, I'm super excited. Um, so yeah, the plant thing. So plants in our yards, our gardens, even on our balcony or even on our windowsill, um, the, the type of plants that we choose are really important if we're interested in supporting wildlife, including birds. Um, so native plants, plants that evolved right here, wherever we find ourselves today across the country, um, attract more um, insects, which in turn attracts more birds. So the key link here is that actually most birds, including um, hummingbirds that drink nectar for some of their, their, their lifetime, and birds of prey like uh, American kestrels, they, these birds all actually need insects at a certain point in their life story. Um, most often to feed their chicks. So if you're if you're a little baby bird and you're trying to make yourself bigger and make more baby bird, then the key thing that you need is actually protein from insects to help you grow. So that's where the link with plants really comes in. And of course, we can see that a bit more obviously other type, types of year. We see hummingbirds drinking nectar from flowers. We'll see maybe American robins eating berries directly from trees. But there's all these indirect links between plants and birds via insects as well. Um, and really the key thing that we can all do is, is choose native plants, so the plants that evolved here over thousands of years with the wildlife that we're, we're trying to support. Um, and it, like I, I wish I had you know, thousands of hectares of land to, to plant native plants on, but I don't. I have a fairly small suburban yard where I've, I've jammed in as many native plants as I can. But no matter what the scale is that you have, like quite literally a, a native plant in a pot on the balcony um, is something that will actually support even a small proportion of, of native insects and in turn birds. Um, and another thing that you can think about doing in if you have some wild space or space that you would like to become wilder is to kind of leave those plants into, into the fall and throughout the winter, because even the dead parts of plants can be really important in supporting creatures throughout the winter, giving them shelter from the fun winter weather that I know some of you are having right now, um, but through to things to eat um, right through into the spring and throughout the summer months as well. Um, and I appreciate many of us aren't, don't have a backyard or don't have the privilege of a cottage or other places where you can necessarily get your hands dirty. There's still lots of neat things that you can do if you're interested in supporting wildlife right in urban areas or rural areas alike. So if you're calling in from a city today, for example, there's an initiative called um, Bird Friendly Cities. And many cities across, across North America, in fact, are actually um, joining this initiative, trying to do things within cities um, to make that that part of the world a little bit safer and a little bit healthier for our feathered friends. And these are organizations that you can join, you can support them, you can um, volunteer with them to try and try and help out feathered friends, even if you don't necessarily able to do something in, in a garden, say yourself. You can also get um, really quite heavily involved in bird conservation through community science initiatives. So. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that later, but things like eBird and iNaturalist are really good ways to, to um, share your observations of, of wildlife. And similarly, you can support conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy of Canada. For example, we protect um, properties in many important bird areas right across the country from coast to coast. Um, one of these sites, in fact, is the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick, um, the Johnson Mills Shorebird Reserve, which I would love to, really love to visit one day myself as well. I would encourage you all to do so. Um, is where there's going to be a whole bunch of shorebirds arriving very, very soon. Well, not quite soon enough, but in a few weeks, um, as many of these birds arrive back from South America, where they'll continue to head um, up to the Arctic for, for breeding. So just a range of things that you can do, whether you want to get your hands dirty or not. Back to you, Andrew. Well, we're getting a lot of questions that have come in uh, through the chat, but also on Facebook. So we'll try to uh, get to as many of these as possible. Uh, yeah. This one came in from Facebook. How can butterflies be attracted? And I imagine monarchs are, are something that's top of mind because they were, they were uh, just classified last year as being endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So monarchs are top of mind for a lot of people. Absolutely, that's a great question. And, and butterflies, including monarchs, are really important animals in, in our backyards. Um, monarchs are really charismatic, relatively easy to identify 
um, butterfly that many of us are fairly familiar with. Um, there's a couple of things that we can do for monarchs specifically, but also um, butterflies and other insects in general. And again, it comes down to, to the, the native plant selection. If you're choosing plants for your yard over the next few weeks, if the snow ever goes away, then choose native plants. They will support um, insects, including butterflies. And monarchs in particular, they, um, they can only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. So there's quite a few different species of milkweed. Um, so they're really important for supporting quite literally baby monarchs. So adult monarchs will come and lay their eggs on milkweed plants and the caterpillars will hatch and, and eat those, those plants. If the monarch lays its eggs on the wrong plant by mistake or because there's no choice in the area, then those caterpillars will become very hungry indeed and will not survive and we won't get monarchs. Um, and there's many other relationships like that between specific insect species and specific plant species. So it's really important to kind of Think about that when you're making plant selections in particular. Um, and a few other butterflies actually that we might start to see, I think some of my friends have already started seeing in, in the far south of Ontario. Um, and things like morning, morning cloak butterflies, these are really quite a large butterfly, almost monarch size as well. They actually spend the winter as adults, they survive as adult butterflies. And one of the key things that's important for them is, is lots of kind of leaf litter and debris, like twigs and logs and things. They, the adult butterflies spend the winter hanging out in nice sheltered spaces like that. So um, if you want to see butterflies like that early in the spring, then it's a really good idea to be a lazy gardener like me and not do too <laughs> much tidying up because that's where those really cool butterflies will be hanging out. Uh, I'm going to get to another question. Uh... I am involved in the planning of a public park that has set aside an area for a pollinator meadow. Is there an NCC support available for a list of indigenous plants we could source? And I know on our website, we have some examples of native plants that could be a point of reference. Absolutely, that's a great question and a super exciting initiative and we'd be happy to follow up with you by email later to give you more specific advice to, to wherever you're, you're calling in from. Um, again, the, the basic answer is, yeah, go, go native. It sounds like you're already um, on that, that idea. So sourcing um, reputably produced native local plants um, is really the best way to, to support lots of pollinators. Um, it is important to kind of take the time to work out, and, and this can take a bit of creative Googling and a bit of digging, we can help you with that, um, to really find things that are not just native to say your province, but actually native to the, the, the community where you are. Because something that I am calling in from Ontario, so something that's native in Southwestern Ontario is really not necessarily native in Northern Ontario, for example. So it become, can become fairly complex, but can be a really fun, fun adventure and journey to learning more about our native plants. And we want to thank Paul Williamson for that question. Laura Dana asks, is there anything that I can do to facilitate the protection of baby robins? Uh, they're nesting on our city townhouse balcony uh, from the magpie that killed the fledglings. Um, so I want to run that one by you. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, certainly in urban areas, especially, we can start to see kind of sometimes sort of imbalances between predator and prey. And that can be because of a whole bunch of factors. But essentially, some, some species do really well in urban environments. They do really well from the garbage that we don't necessarily deal with very, very quickly or responsibly in some cases, or just things that blow out of your hand or get dragged around. Um, and so Birds like both robins and magpies, in fact, to use those examples, can do really well in urban areas, but it also puts them kind of sometimes directly in conflict with one another. Um, I'm not sure what to suggest, to be honest with you. I mean, the, the magpie is doing its best to presumably raise its chicks as well, and it, it, it you know, needs to, needs, to, needs to feed as well. And I appreciate it can be really hard to sometimes see nature playing out its, its course right on your balcony. Um, so you could let nature run its course, appreciate that can be challenging. Um, you could perhaps find a way to, to put some caging or something around the balcony to dissuade the magpie from, from coming in. Um, obviously you wanna be really careful that you don't set something up that would accidentally entrap either the magpie or the robins because the adult robins will need to come and go to, to bring food to their chicks. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure it's, it's a tricky situation for sure, um, but I, 
wish you all the best and your Robins all the best too. We got a question from Facebook uh, on Facebook, and we want to thank everybody tuning in there along with the on our Zoom uh, pro program here tonight. Uh, can you talk about the obsession with dandelions? Why are they so hated by gardeners? <laughs> and should we be poisoning them? Are they really harmful to our lawn? Oh, the dandelion question. Awesome. So thank you for that question. Yeah, it is something that circulates every spring is, is should I, shouldn't I deal with dandelions? So as usual, it is somewhat complicated. Um, so I'd say, as, as you'll probably notice, there, there will be bees and potentially butterflies that will come to dandelion flowers and will drink the nectar and go off and be happy bees and happy butterflies. So that's not a terrible thing. That's better than if there were no dandelions in your lawn or if there were no flowering plants in your lawn. What would be better though is if it was a native plant instead. So although you'll see things drinking nectar from non-native plants like dandelions, um, that nectar isn't necessarily feeding them quite as well as, as it could be if it were a native plant. So again, it really comes back down to evolution that our, our wildlife has evolved with the plants that were native to here. And they're now in some places, especially in urban areas, are kind of scraping by trying to find the best food that they can get their little, little feet and paws onto. And that's not necessarily the, the perfect nutrition for them. So if you have the opportunity, then maybe reduce your lawn a little bit and plant some, some truly native plants in there instead to better support um, some of those, those pollinators. And that also has the added benefit that although things will come to non-native plants to drink the nectar, they won't necessarily be able to lay their eggs on them. So back to the kind of monarch example that if one adult monarch butterflies will drink nectar from all sorts of flowers, including non-native flowers, but if there's no milkweeds, they can't lay their eggs and their caterpillars will, will not exist. So the same is true for, for bees and, and other, other animals that they, they need not just food, they need the whole kind of life cycle to be supported throughout the seasons. So that's we a, a long-winded answer. <laughs> that's okay. A lot of detail and important information to share with, with people. Uh, we know that bird populations have been in decline all around the world. We're seeing uh, studies and reports every five years or so about this. And Canada is no exception in terms of seeing uh, bird populations in decline. Vary, what's the, the biggest cause of this? And how does it underscore why we need to lend birds a hand? Yeah, great question. And again, as, as, a, as a birder, then I, I find this really heartbreaking seeing and reading, like I actually experiencing declines in birds firsthand, but also reading um, scientific reports showing these demonstrated declines. Um, so the, the biggest underlying problem that, that most of our birds are facing is, is good old simple habitat loss. So losing essentially patches of native vegetation that supports the, the food that the birds need to eat and that supports places where they can shelter and where they can make their nests. And that's something that the Nature Conservancy of Canada is working on right across the country, protecting habitat before it's lost and actually restoring habitat, trying to bring that habitat back in places where it has already been lost. Um, and so there's, there's billions of individuals from over kind of 400 or so species of bird that breed in Canada every single year. And there's lots of things that we can all do individually. We've, we've touched on a few of these things already. Um, we mentioned a little bit about the, the cat issue earlier that not only are birds suffering from habitat loss, they're also suffering from being, being eaten or disturbed by things like outdoor cats. Um, and kind of like the dandelions in some ways, cats are not native to North America. Um, they receive, um, in the case of a domestic um, pet, they receive medical attention and shelter and food, but they still go out and predate animals if you let them outside. So um, you can keep your cat indoors. And I appreciate this. I have four formerly feral cats. It is a bunch of work to train your feral cats to not want to go outside, but it is possible. Um, you can build an outdoor enclosure. You can build a catio. There's some really, really cool examples of um, catios online. You can visit there's a website called catsandbirds.ca that has some really neat examples of catio designs that, that can be a really nice way to, to give your cat some outdoor time, but protect the cat from um, the risks of going outside if you're a cat and also protect wildlife from, from your cat. Um, another threat that... Um, is becoming increasingly apparent 
um, in urban areas in particular is um, birds, especially during migration, flying into glass windows and patio doors and, and glass patio railings as well. Um, so birds can't necessarily see glass and they can't discern the difference between a reflection of a plant and an actual plant that might be through the glass. And so hundreds and hundreds of birds, thousands of birds um, die every single spring and again every single fall during these peak migration seasons um, by flying into our windows. And because there's a, a lot more houses than there are commercial buildings, then our houses, my windows here in London, um, you know, or your cottage, your patio railings, whatever, are a really big part of that, that challenge. But Absolutely. good news is there's some really easy things we can we can do to stop that. So there's a commercial solution called feather friendly tape that you can pop on the outside of your glass. And that essentially just uh, appears as a marker. The birds can see that and they're like, oh, hang on, there's something there. I'm going to fly around instead. Um, you can also do a kind of DIY system yourself. If you're artistic, completely unlike me, then you can draw some cool patterns and things on the outside that will help make it visible. Or you can make a kind of template and, and put kind of markers on the windows for, for the birds to see. Um, so that's a few things that you can do at home um, regarding those kind of real kind of mortality events. Mm -hmm. And kind of longer term things you can do, again, we mentioned it a little bit already, is kind of be a bit of a messy gardener if you have an outdoor space or even on your balcony as well. Like, Don't be too quick to clean up those fallen leaves and leave those dead stems because they will be harboring um, beneficial insects that will either pollinate sometimes our food um, will also turn into to bird food later on in the, in the season. So lots of really good things that you can do right at home that actually really will have a significant effect cumulatively on some of these really tragic losses in birds. Oh, that's, that's a lot of great information there, especially how to bird proof your home because you, you're seeing more and more examples hearing about, about bird strikes and people want to do something about it. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here that have come in. Uh, one's from Facebook. Uh, I live on the seventh floor of an apartment building. Do you think that I can attract birds to feeders on my balcony? And uh, the yeah. other question I want to tack on to it is from Heather Hart. Uh, what are some examples of native plants that could be appropriate to put on a balcony or in a garden flower bed, that type of thing? Great, yeah. So in terms of the, the, the several floors off the ground question, then I think it's always worth giving it a shot. Um, I don't know for sure, but um, one thing to bear in mind is that, that both birds that are migrating, but also just kind of cruising around, um, but also insects, they do actually migrate and travel at quite high altitudes, like well above many of our buildings. Um, so they will use that kind of full spectrum of ground level right up to well above building heights. It's always worth a shot. Um, and even if you don't happen to see anything directly on your plants on your balcony, then you, know, you never know, there might be some little creature that did actually benefit from that mouthful of nectar or um, the insect that that plant did actually support um, later on in life. So I think it's always worth trying. And the other thing to bear in mind is that native plants are, you know, they're really beautiful. So if nothing else, you will get some enjoyment out of, of selecting a, a nice plant in that situation. So in terms of what plants to choose. So um, it really depends on where you are. It's worth spending some time and it's a really fun learning journey to work out, you know, where am I and what plants are actually native to my part of the world. Um, and in terms of things for in plant and plant pots and on balconies or maybe on pots on hot sunny decks, things like that, then it's worth thinking about plants that are perhaps quite drought tolerant. Um, even if you're a really um, responsible gardener or responsible plant pot manager, then it's very quick and easy for pots to dry out. So to give yourself a bit of a break, then pick a plant that's quite happy being dried out. So you might be looking for plants that, that grow naturally in, in dry sandy conditions, like on sand dunes and beaches, those kind of plants. Um, or maybe on kind of rocky areas like, like alvars. This is a very rare habitat that occurs around the Great Lakes. So where you get bedrock on the surface, there's some plants that have evolved to, to deal with those really droughty conditions. And those can be the types of plants that are very good choices for pots or situations where you, you don't necessarily have access to lots of water. And in general, if you have you know, not those plant pot constraints, then again, just 
pick something that works for the, the moisture levels and the, the sun or shade conditions that you have that is actually native to your, your area. That would be my, my best advice. And there's a, a, a related question is, is there a list of suppliers that have native plants and are they available at big box stores throughout Canada? That's submitted by an anonymous attendee. So thank you, anonymous attendee. My, I know my yeah. recommendation is if you have local garden centers uh, and they, they have experts, quite often you can uh, approach them and ask for their insight around what native plants would be appropriate for soils in your local community, but also which ones are native versus which ones are oriental or, or non-native plants. Uh, Vary any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And in some ways I don't have a good answer because it's changing so fast, but in a really positive way, which is actually really cool. Um, when I first moved to Canada um, kind of over 15 years ago, I kind of started asking around and box stores and garden centers for native plants. And quite often I was met with fairly blank stares, whereas now I think it's more like, oh yeah, actually the section's over here. Um, so I think keep asking those questions wherever you go, um, because it's people like you, the consumer that's asking questions that will start to trickle down into realizing that there is a demand for native plants. Um, it's worth spending some time doing, doing a little bit of research yourself online. Um, there's a few resources on the Nature Conservancy of Canada website, like Andrew mentioned. Reach out to us um, and reach out to other local organizations as well, because it's sometimes there's still a bit of confusion about the difference between a plant that's truly native to an area and a plant that happens to grow well in that area, because those can actually be two different things. Um, a lot of our non-native invasive plants are invasive simply because they do actually do really well it does not mean that they're native so there's some subtleties in language sometimes that that hasn't always filtered through but um yeah local local organizations um so in in ontario for example there's conservation authorities are, are often running native plant um sales even or have advice um farmers markets can be really good places as well to to check into to native plant opportunities so it depends on where you are but i think it's always worth asking the question to make the case that this is something that that you're you're interested in seeing available for sale quite a few people who have submitted questions uh here this evening uh they live in high-rise apartments and so they're asking if they can have native plants and their planters on their balcony or windowsills, will the birds actually visit them? How high will the birds go? And what about pollinators? Do you have any insight on that in terms of how high you have to be in an apartment building to try and attract uh, pollinators and, yeah. and birds? Yeah, it's a great question. And like, I would put it back to our, our audience and give it a go and tell us what happened. Like, Put some native plants on your balcony and tell us how high you are and, and drop us a note in the fall to tell us what, what did come to your plant. Um, I, I think it's always worth trying. Um, and as I mentioned before, native plants can be really beautiful and give you lots of real interest to look at. So even if you don't happen to notice if the hummingbird came by or the, the fun bee showed up or whatever, then um, hopefully you still get some enjoyment out of the plant itself. And I really think it's always worth trying. Um, Insects kind of drift around to some extent with, with air currents, so it's going to depend a little bit on, on very specific local patterns of the way air flows, in fact, and the way the wind kind of buffets around your building. Um, it's also going to depend really where you are, how close you are to a natural space. So if you're close to a forest or a wetland or some kind of natural park or something like that, then you may well start seeing things more quickly and in, in greater numbers than you might if you're completely surrounded by other buildings and, and urban urban setting. Um, but it's always worth a go. And if you can get some of your neighbors above and below and beside you on board, then you could create a whole bunch of, of habitat that over time will, will maybe start attracting some things. So give it a go and let us know. And butterflies, hummingbirds, bees, they're all popular visitors. Uh, people are, are curious as to how they can attract them to their, their balconies, as we heard earlier. But what about wasps? That's a question that we've got. Are these pollinators as well? 
Yeah, so there's actually many, many species of wasp, including many that are native. So the, the big kind of black and yellow wasp that you often see um, attracted to kind of rotting fruit and stuff, and especially in the fall, um, that can include some non-native species. But there's a whole bunch of other native both wasps and, and wasp lookalikes, little hoverflies. And some of them can actually be really important pollinators as well. For whatever reason, bees get all of the press. Um, but there's there's a whole bunch of wasps as well that are really quite benign and quite happy for you to ignore them while they forage on plants and, and do their little pollinator job. Um, and so it's, it's certainly worth thinking about, again, native plants that provide that, that correct nutrition for all of these animals and create little places for them to, to spend the winter and lay their eggs and, and all of these important things. Um, it's kind of like like some children are really fussy fussy eaters, um, and I like to think of insects like that as well. That that some some insects are general, so quite happy going going to whichever restaurant on the street to to find their food. Others are super super fussy and will only go to one species, or in some cases like monarchs, one group of species. Um, and that's for where we come in. It's really important for us to kind of provide that that big range of nice restaurants for insects to support all of the cool birds and butterflies and things as well that we like to see. We got a question from Enza. What can I replace my grass with to make it more friendly? So talking about ground cover here, uh, yeah. maybe someone looking to get rid of their lawn and, and maybe do less lawn mowing and, and maybe perhaps planting native flowers. Sure, great stuff. Well, congratulations for, for planning to do that. And I definitely encourage you to do that if you if you have the, the energy and the, the desire to do so. Um, so I think making lawn slightly smaller piece by piece is, is a really good way to support more, more wildlife. You can replace, you can, this is what I did in my front yard and my backyard. I simply dug it up and planted native plants where I used to have lawn. Um, and so again, it depends on what kind of moisture regime your soil has and how sunny or shady it is, what kind of native plants would be good to replace your lawn with. Um, so again, do, do a bunch of creative Googling, reach out to us, we can give you some more specific information. Um, it's also important to think about, do you want something that's still going to do the job of a lawn? Do you need something for dogs or kids to play on? Do you need something that behaves as a trail for you to walk between parts of your, your property on? Um, because if that's the case, then you're, you're going to need something that will withstand being trampled. So um, some of our native grasses, for example, they're actually kind of what's called tussocks or kind of clump forming grasses. And they're really not suitable if you want to walk there um, because of those big kind of lumps on the ground. So think about what you need your space to still be able to do and, and be practical about what you actually need on your property. Um, if you don't need that kind of access or flat space, then there's a whole bunch of native plants that you can jam in and place. Um, my yard in, in London and southern Ontario, um, I planted a lot of um, it's a native woodland strawberry, and that's actually infiltrated the bits of lawn that I have left. So my lawn is kind of a little bit of grass and a whole bunch of native strawberry, and also there's a native plantain. And both of those species have are really quite low growing and have fairly flat leaves and seem to be quite happy with me trampling it and mowing it and things like that. So um, so think about how you need how you need the space to behave and, and select your plants accordingly, I think I would, would be my advice. Since 2016, a Nature Conservancy of Canada has promoted a small acts of conservation challenge that can benefit nature, you and your community. We have a website where people can access the information, smallaxe.ca, register and participate from there. Vary, can you describe some of those tips? I mean, there's ways of making your yard more bird friendly uh, to various things that people can do. Um, should people get bird feeders, build a bee hotel, how to attract more of these species? How can you encourage people to take some of these small acts on? Because some people might think it's, it won't make a big difference for birds, but collectively, if more people all across the country undertake these small acts, it really can make a, a big difference for, for nature. Absolutely. And as usual, it's not a straightforward answer. So hold on to your seats, I guess. Um, so I think that, that, again, the single biggest thing that we can all do is, is select native plants, if at all possible. Um, for the most part, to go to the kind of bird feeder question first, for for the most part, in most situations, 
our wild birds don't they don't really need us to feed them in most situations. Um, what they'd really prefer is is a whole bunch of of vegetation where they can go forage and and build their nests and all of that kind of stuff. So if we can provide that first of all, then that's probably the first first thing to really try. Um, but having said that, I I really appreciate how how important bird feeders can be for helping people engage with the natural world. I know I I grew up in Scotland and my dad always had a bird feeder out in the winter months when it was cold. And that was one of the things that really got me hooked on, on birds and birding and conservation and by extension is why I'm here talking to you today. Um, so I really appreciate the importance that bird feeders can, can have for, for many people. Um, I know when the weather's pretty, pretty unpleasant or you're not feeling very well or you're injured or whatever, um, you're not able to go outside as much. So having having a bird feeder to really attract people, mm -hmm. attract birds closer to your window is, is, gives great comfort um, to many, many people. So that's definitely something to bear in mind. But I think we can all take a few steps to make sure that we're doing it safely for the birds and other, other wildlife. So one of the key things is to, um, for the most part, other animals are attracted to bird feeders or bird foods. And often those animals don't really need our help. So I'm thinking about things like squirrels and raccoons and possums in southern Ontario, especially. Um, and these are really cute little animals and they have their place, of course, but they they do really, really well with our garbage and our compost and our spilt bird food and things like that. And they actually will go on to predate bird nests and, and other other animals as well. So it, it's a good idea to not try to not subsidize or feed those animals as, as much as, as can be easy to do so inadvertently when you're trying to feed birds. Um, so it's a good idea to use a proper, properly designed high quality bird feeder that you can hang above somewhere where squirrels and things can't jump onto it. Um, that also will mean that you don't need to keep refilling the feeder quite as often because if you've got mm -hmm. very hungry squirrel, then you're gonna be spending quite a lot of money on, on bird seed quite quickly. The other thing that's really important as we learn more and more about the diseases that birds carry, then um, keeping those feeders and the whole area around your feeders as clean as you can and without too much spilt food is really important. Um, and also pay attention to any local advisories. So um, sometimes there's outbreaks of, of there's a disease called avian pox, which can be really damaging for birds' eyes. And sometimes um, if that's coming through your area, then it is recommended that you take your feeders down, give them a good clean, store them for a few weeks until that disease outbreak has kind of calmed down. Um, and of course, avian flu is something that's at top of mind as well right now in various parts of the world. Um, and thinking about if you have, for example, if you have um, waterfowl nearby or you have um, chickens or water, waterfowl um, that you're, you're growing or you're, you're farming, then having attracting lots of wild birds in is maybe not a great idea as well because they can kind of help help transmit avian flu between wild populations and domestic populations. So there's a bunch of things like that that you need to be quite careful about to make sure that we're not actually accidentally causing harm instead of actually helping our little feathery mm -hmm. friends. Yeah, that's a great point because um, you don't want them to, to cause any kind of incidents or anything like that. And, and that's an inevitable question. What can we do to keep squirrels, bear and deer mm -hmm. away from our plants and bird feeders? <laughs> Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's, it's the inevitable thing, right? So I um, there's no easy answers to all of these situations, of course. Um, I kind of lost my squirrel battle with my bird feeders this last winter as well. I guess my my local garden squirrels have finally worked out that they can leap from a fence that I thought was far enough away onto my bird feeder. Apparently, they're super squirrels now. Um, so I'm actually just this last weekend and hopefully with the nice weather coming up this weekend going to completely redesign our bird feeding station so that we can make it easier to keep it clean and keep it keep it away from from squirrels. Um, certainly if you're in, in bear country then it's usually recommended that you take bird feeders down during bear clock so when your bears emerge from hibernation. Um, it's probably not a great idea to have a whole bunch of tasty snacks hanging on your your house. Um, Similar, like I said, if there's disease outbreaks and things, then um, you want to not attract wildlife through to higher densities than they would be naturally. Um, yeah, and in terms of keeping 
um, the wildlife that we attract to our native plants away from our native plants. So I get questions about um, squirrels and chipmunks digging things up and deer and, and rabbits browsing on, on plants. And like in some ways, that's great. You've kind of mission accomplished. You've attracted wildlife to your garden. Um, but I appreciate how frustrating that is, especially if you've spent some money on some native plants and then along comes Mr. Bunny and he comes and digs everything up again. Um, so again, there's not really simple answers. Um, one thing that I found is quite effective is just putting some wire cages around individual plants or around areas where you've just planted things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm lucky I haven't had to deal with deer because that would be quite a lot of wire. Um, but keeping bunnies and in my case, groundhogs away from things has, has been a little bit of a battle. Um, but the good thing is that many of our native plants are actually perennial species. And so you might find that you just need to kind of protect them for maybe one or two seasons, like one or two years of growth. And then they'll have enough of a root system that they can survive a little bit of browsing from animals as they cruise through. Um, so you might need to put up with kind of investing in something that might not look super pretty for the first few years, but over time you can probably take those kind of protections away um, and let your, your plants kind of establish and thrive and probably survive a little bit of browsing would be my recommendation. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna go to a question that came in on Facebook because it's, it's somewhat related uh, to this. Uh, in our municipality, we are being strongly, and they put that in caps, strongly discouraged from feeding birds because rats are moving in. Now, what can we do? Yeah, and that, that is sort of like a common issue, especially in urban areas. Um, and a, a key thing is that, you know, rats, like many other mammals, are attracted by food. So bird feeders can be a very good way to attract rats. Um, something that you can potentially try is if you have a feeder hanging, then you can actually get some kind of tray or rig up something underneath the feeder to catch all of the food. Because birds are messy, right? They'll kind of stick their little heads in and throw half the seed over their shoulders, it seems. But if you have a tray underneath, like maybe a piece of mesh or something that's nice and taut so nobody gets trapped in it, then that can catch all of that fallen stuff and you can dispose of that or actually put it back in the feeder if it's clean seed. Um, so that can sometimes help keep things out of reach of rats, but rats are tricky because they're pretty good climbers as well. Um, so it might be might be that you, you can't actually put feeders up for a while. Um, another thing you can do is look for other sources of food that are maybe attracting rats. So think about how garbage in the area is being managed and how compost and things like that are being managed because perhaps there's ways to kind of better seal up some of those things to reduce other sources of food for rats. Let them kind of disperse um, for a few months or even a year or two and then maybe start slowly introducing bird feeders um, where you actually contain the food out of, out of ratty reach as far as possible. Okay. That would be my suggestions. Yeah. Denise Clare writes in, and we talked about this briefly a little bit earlier about ground cover and grass and maybe converting lawns uh, into native flower beds and this type of thing. And the question from Denise is, how do you deal with mosquitoes? If we let the grass go, the mosquitoes are very, very bad. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, mosquitoes are, like it or not, part of our ecosystem and there are other animals that feed on them. So they're, they're one of these things that we deal with living in Canada, of course. Um, <clears throat> you, can, you can certainly um, do your best to minimize mosquito breeding habitat. So I do have a pond in my yard, but I have um, a system where the water kind of circulates a little bit and that slows the mosquitoes down a little bit um, to degree. I've also, over time, there's American toads and green frogs and things that have actually moved in and discovered that habitat and they actually do a pretty good job at keeping mosquito larva density down um, and it's but beyond that like it's worth being practical about what you can do around say your house um, and things like kind of keeping things mown so that you have access so that you don't have mosquito or tick issues it, it, you, you do have to be practical as well as conservation minded so I, I would say do what you need to do to still have a, a comfortable lifestyle wherever it is that you are. Um, but to a degree, we, we probably do need to change our mm -hmm. comfort levels a little bit when it comes to, to wildlife, because these things are, are often important parts of our ecosystems too. 
I'm going to group a couple of questions together because they're, they're similar. Uh, the first one's from Trudy Johnson, who writes in, I understand common milkweed is not allowed in Nova Scotia, and it is an aggressive weed. So I planted swamp milkweed as it is permitted, and also butterfly milkweed. Does common, milk, common milkweed just grow naturally in Ontario, and is the swamp milkweed encouraged to be grown by gardeners? Great question. So I have very similar experience in my yard in London. Weirdly, it took me ages to get common milkweed actually established in my yard. And I almost wish that I hadn't because it was so aggressive. Um, and I've, I've replaced quite a lot of it with exactly those two species that you mentioned, butterfly weeds and swamp milkweeds. Um, those two species are actually much kind of friendlier, well-behaved milkweed species. And they, they do support monarchs um, just as much as common milkweed does. Um, so again, depending on where you are across the country, then you can look into some of the more arguably interesting milkweed species if you have, especially relatively restricted space, or you kind of don't want to be taken over entirely by common milkweed, then um, pick a different milkweed species that is a bit better behaved. Um, there's some actually really interesting ones. There's a little, little kind of delicate one called whirled milkweed, uh, which might actually make a really good planter species. I'm not sure, I haven't tested that out yet, but it's a really delicate little plant, which again, monarchs will use. Um, so yeah, great that you're trying some different milkweed species and definitely encourage you to, to keep, keep, keep pl playing in that direction. And Brennan uh, says, I've heard it's best not to plant milkweed unless it's a lot is planted, as once a small amount is eaten up, what do you do then? So true or false, is it best not to plant milkweed unless you really commit to it? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, to, to an extent, the, the butterflies are probably smarter than we think that they are, and that they will, the adult female will be flying around assessing where she should lay her eggs. And if she only finds one squinty little baby milkweed plant, then she might well be like, hey, that doesn't look great for my caterpillar babies. I'm going to go try somewhere else that has more milkweed density. Um, so to a degree, I think we need to kind of leave mama butterfly to make her decisions. Um, but it's certainly a fair point. If you create habitat in general for wildlife, then it's really nice if we can kind of keep that going over time. Um, and as I mentioned before, that there are some other milkweed species that, that might be more appropriate in many garden settings because they are a bit better behaved and they will survive year on year on year. From time to time, there will be other insect pests that or insects that will come and behave as pests and perhaps demolish um, your milkweed plant. But to some extent, that would probably be happening in nature anyway and is part of kind of natural cycles of, of kind of boom and bust of, of many of our species. So monarchs aren't the only caterpillars that will, that will eat milkweed leaves. There's a, a kind of tussock, I forget, I think it's milkweed tussock moth, I think, that is a really cool fuzzy caterpillar that also uses milkweed. Um, and sometimes they can get fairly abundant and, and really do quite a lot of eating. So um, that's not necessarily a terrible thing, but if you can diversify the different species that you have and, and have lots of different types of things and ideally quite a few of each species, then your monarchs and other animals are probably going to be happy. And mm -hmm. ideally, if you can persuade your neighbors to do the same thing too, or um, talk to your, your local um, local people that might have other, other land that maybe they, you can encourage them to, to select native plants as well. You can kind of magnify the impact and don't have to look at your garden in isolation anymore. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's a great point. And I just want to give a shout out as well to everybody participating in our webinar chat. A lot of engaged people tonight with, with super ideas, uh, helping each other. So I just want to compliment everybody uh, participating in the webinar chat. Uh, just about 10 minutes left. Uh, so I just want to cover as many questions as, as possible. Uh, when is it safe in the spring to clean up the garden? so as not to disturb overwintering insects? Great question. And there's there's been a number of initiatives. One of them is the, the no mow may concept that you may have come across. Um, these are really nice ideas, but the, the reality is that, you know, even just within a single province in Canada, then we have a lot of latitude to cover in lots of different habitats. And there really isn't a single magic temperature or a single magic date where suddenly mm -hmm. it's safe to do all of that kind of cleanup. Um, I would 
I would vote for being as lazy as possible and not doing any cleanup ever. <laughs> um, if we want to be absolute purists about conserving habitat for animals. Again, you need to be practical. I mean, I need to scrape the, the leaves off my driveway so I can actually shovel the snow in the winter and things like that. So you, you, you need to be sensible about, about what, you, what kind of cleanup needs to happen for both practical and safety and aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, instead of the kind of no more May thing, I like the idea of slow mo. Um, so whenever it is you need to get out and do some cleanup for whatever reason, then maybe pick a nice warm sunny day and, and go about it nice and slowly. Um, and the reason being that quite a lot of, well, insects and snakes, toads, frogs even, um, that gives them a chance to warm up enough so they can hop out of your way. Um, so especially if you're using a lawnmower or something like that, then do it nice and slowly and gently and do it in the middle of the day where it's nice and warm so that those little creatures can find the, the energy to get out of the way. Um, and yeah, do, do it do it kind of gradually. Maybe don't do it all at once. Things have places to move move off to as well. Um, but there isn't really a sort of magic safe date. There's there's insects and other animals kind of completing their life cycles really throughout the year. In fact, in debris and things and underground as well. We haven't had a chance to really get into invasive species, uh, but we we should touch on it. Should people get rid of rid of all their non-native plants and how can you tell if it's a non-native and doesn't belong there? Great question. So I mean we we obviously acknowledge that gardens are exactly that. They're they're a garden. They're they're an artificial thing that we've created and all of us have different motivations in our gardens and um you know there's there's different reasons for planting certain plants and whether it's in a garden or, or in a balcony or anywhere. Um, you know, our mission, of course, is to kind of encourage people to support um, native wildlife and so forth. So the so native plants are definitely better than non-native or cultivars. Um, but it's perfectly okay to have a mixture of things. I mean, I happen to be a purist. I kind of ripped out a whole bunch of stuff and composted <laughs> it. And, um, but I also have a vegetable garden. I have a bit of lawn and the two big canopy trees in my garden that, that were there when I moved in are actually both non-native plant, non-native trees. Um, but I take advantage of their shade to grow a native woodland garden underneath those, those non-native trees and, and planting native trees so that over time when those, those big trees end up um, senescing and, and dying, probably when I'm gone, then there will be a whole bunch of native trees ready to take their place. So you can kind of take it at, at whatever level you want to take, just bearing in mind that from a purely wildlife perspective, then native is, is definitely best. Um, mm -hmm. and in terms of identifying invasive non-native plants, then that's tricky. So there's, there's a series of, um, there's a community science app called iNaturalist, which is a really great resource for helping you learn about all species actually anywhere in the world. All you have to do is snap a photo of it with your camera or with your smartphone, um, upload that, that photo with the location and the date and the time. And it uses artificial intelligence to try to come up with a likely identification for your species, whether it's a dandelion on the sidewalk or a, you know, a tree in the middle of a forest. Um, and once you have a, a, a likely species name, you can then do a bunch of research around that species. You can then Google about it and learn, you know, is this native to my area? Is it, in, is it invasive? Is it introduced? Um, and learn a little bit more about um, whether it's something that if it's a new garden, you might want to think about phasing out or if it's something that actually is native that you want to encourage. So there's, there's resources like that that are, are really good, um, good resources to help you learn a little bit more about the things that are, are all around you. And if you want to take it a step further to, to make some decisions about what you might want to keep in your garden or not. Okay, uh, here's an interesting question. I hear a lot about the benefits of leaving the leaves. This is from Kathleen Lush. But I wonder about the effectiveness with the large amount of snow that we can get here in Ontario. Can overwintering creatures really survive under the leaves in the snow? Great question. And I'll try to keep the sharks. I know we're running low on time, but mm. again, it's not always that straightforward. It turns out that different species of tree make different types of leaves. Um, so a common non-native and actually quite invasive tree in especially urban and garden settings is the Norway maple. 
And it turns out that normally maple leaves, when they fall on the ground and get squished by the snow, then they form a particularly dense, heavy, soggy mat. And that can actually be quite problematic for native plants like trillium and, and wild ginger and things like that, that are maybe trying to push their way through that. They don't kind of dry and curl up in the same way as some of our native tree leaves actually do. So it kind of, so you start have to thinking have to be thinking about the species of dead leaf that you have in your garden. Um, it's certainly no problem to go in and kind of fluff them up a little bit or move them around gently and give a little bit of space for things that are coming up through it. Um, just kind of poke away gently. If it's if you think it's native leaf litter, then I would I would leave well alone for the most part. Our our animals have have evolved to deal with this kind of weather that we get in Ontario, big buckets of snow and followed by kind of hot, dry summers, then that's kind of what some of our creatures are quite happy with. Lorraine, uh, Lorraine asks, the only birds I get in my backyard are sparrows and robins. How do I attract other types of birds? Yeah, good question. Again, if you have the opportunity to, to jam in some, some native plants, if you haven't already, that's, that's a great idea. Um, Again, I, I think I missed where, where that question came from, but um, here in Ontario, Southern Ontario, actually quite a lot of Ontario, um, there's a plant called wild columbine, which is a really beautiful flowering um, orange and, and yellow flower. And they're really good at attracting hummingbirds. Like I planted some quite early on in my, my garden here and I was just blown away when hummingbirds just showed up and were foraging on these flowers quite quickly. So um, that could be an example of something to try out depending on where you are. If you have a little little corner, um, you could try some, some new plants and see what you get. Mm -hmm. I want to ask it this one quickly. Would it be better to plant more flowers or herbs or edible plants to encourage pollinators? And that question is from Fox Burkhardt. Yeah, so again, it depends on your own personal motivations, what you want to get out of gardening. As I mentioned, I have a fairly purist native plant garden, and then I have a vegetable garden, which is where I grow some of my food. Um, and those are fairly separate in the yard, and I suspect one benefits a little bit from the other. I'm supporting pollinators that I'm hoping are going to pop over and pollinate some of my vegetables. Um, in terms of thinking about food for wildlife, then really maximizing the diversity. So lots of different species, lots of different species groups as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have the space and the inclination, then think about some trees that, that and shrubs that produce berries for those kind of fall migratory birds. Think about some grasses that produce seeds for, for sparrows and things like that that need seeds. Um, think about for some, some flowering plants that produce nectar for hummingbirds and, and monarch butterflies and things like that. Um, even with quite a small space, you can probably do quite a lot, cater to quite a lot of those different needs um, with only just a few, you know, two or three different species, perhaps. Great stuff. Well, we had so many questions, just impossible to get to them all. It wasn't feasible, but we'll do our very best to answer all of them in the coming, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a big thanks to you, Vari, for, for giving us all some helpful tips and tricks. Uh, just any closing comment? It's been great. I've been blown away by the number of questions and I can see that I've got quite a lot of work ahead of me over the next few days to, to come <laughs> up with some answers to all of these great questions and hoping that there's going to be going to be some of you guys helping me out as well. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed it and um, there's always lots more information out there that we're, we're happy to share. So thanks for all the questions and thanks for tuning in. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone who participated in the chat, folks who submitted questions. If you like today's event and want to know about upcoming ones or to get the latest on conservation efforts by the Nature Conservancy of Canada and ways to connect with nature, make sure you sign up to get our emails by visiting natureconservancy.ca slash sign up. And for more information and ways you can get involved, visit our Small Acts of Conservation page. That's at smallaxe.ca. A link to this recording will be shared with you shortly via email. And again, on behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight. Some excellent questions, very engaged chat. And it was really encouraging to see as people want to uh, embrace, get that, they have an itch for spring and get out there and do things on your in your lawns and your gardens and your balconies. So. Thanks for all your engagement tonight. Have a great rest of your day. We hope to see you again next time.
Good night.